There are some stories out there where it becomes difficult to distinguish facts from fiction simply because, well, the story seems too good to be true. But then again, like a wise man once said, How often have I said to you that once you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. On a cold morning in the winter of 1906, Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes, was seen getting on a train in London. Now, even back then, he was quite a celebrity, so naturally people started staring, wondering where he was off to. But he knew he couldn't tell anyone, at least not just yet. So to avoid any further questioning, he quickly slipped into a compartment, settled into a corner and hid his face behind a newspaper. And anyway, he thought to himself, even if he did tell someone the strange series of events that had led up to this point, who would believe him? Who would believe that a few weeks ago, an Indian man accused of a terrible crime had written a letter to him. In this letter, the man had said that he was being framed, that he was innocent, and that his last hope was that Maybe, just maybe, the brilliant mind behind the world's greatest detective would be able to see something that others had missed and solve the case for him. But what was even more unbelievable was that something about the letter had actually caught his attention and made him want to help the man. And now, like Sherlock Holmes had done on so many occasions in the books, his author was also off to solve a case and prove a man's innocence. As the train left London, his mind began to drift. He started thinking about the case. A case that would bring together the worlds of fact and fiction. A case that would showcase the ugliest as well as the most hopeful parts of humanity. A story of India and England, of murder and racism. A story that started three years ago with the murder of a horse. On the morning of February 3rd, 1903, the residents of Great Worley, a village in England, woke up to a horrifying sight. Someone had crept into one of their stables in the dead of night, slit open the belly of a horse and left it to die. By the morning, all that was left of the horse was a rotting pile of flesh. But that was just the beginning. Over the next few weeks, more animal killings followed. Villagers would wake up to find horses, sheep and cows lying in the fields with their blood and guts spilling out onto the ground. Soon, the news of the killing spread far and wide across England and Great Worley became known as the Village of Fear and this serial killer of animals became known as the Worley Ripper. The local police were clueless. They even set up camps every night in the village to try to catch the killer but to no success. Every attack followed the same pattern. The killer came in the dead of night, undetected, killed an animal and somehow left without a trace. But then, one month after the first attack, things became even stranger. Someone had started writing anonymous letters to the police, taunting them for not being able to catch the killers. This pattern where an animal was slaughtered in the village and a few letters popped up at the police station continued for several months until in August, almost six months after the first attack, one of the letters made an accusation. It said that the killer was a man named George Edalji. In the late 1870s, an Indian man named Shapurji Edalji converted from his Parsi faith to Christianity and moved from Bombay to Britain in search of better opportunities. Once he was there, he started working with the church and married an English woman named Charlotte. Together, they moved to the village of Great Worley to start a new life together. After moving to Worley, they had a son named George. Now, as a kid, George was shy, reserved, socially awkward, but also pretty good academically. And indeed, he grew up to become a lawyer. But even as an adult, he didn't change much. He still lived a pretty boring life. 
and could be found either at home where he lived with his parents or at work. He didn't drink and didn't like to hang out at the pub and generally just kept to himself. However, this kind of a behavior did not win him many friends in the village. A mysterious dark-skinned foreigner from a strange land who refused to socialize with you over a pint at the local pub. Nah, that, <laughs> that didn't work in 19th century England. So you can see, when the animal killing started, the local villagers and the local police already had a suspect in mind. The letter accusing George directly was just icing on the cake. On the night of August 17th, the day after the letter accusing George was sent to the police, a storm was ripping through the worldly countryside. That night was dark and windy and the rain was hammering the village mercilessly. All the villagers retreated indoors waiting for the storm to pass. In the morning when the villagers came out to check for damages, they found another horse killed. This time, the police did not waste a single second. They raided George's home and found a coat, a pair of wet boots and a razor. To them, the case was closed. George's parents protested that George was with them all night and possibly could not have done it. George even said that he never used a razor. It wasn't his. He always went to the barber shop. Just go and ask the barber. But the police were beyond listening at this point. George was arrested and sent to wait for his trial to begin. This trial was a complete joke, by the way. It lasted for just 50 minutes. Just let that sink in. It took just 50 minutes for a jury to find George guilty of such a heinous crime with such little evidence. The judge pronounced George guilty not only of the animal murders, but also, strangely enough, they accused him of writing the letters himself to the police, apparently in an effort to mislead the police investigation. And with that senseless verdict, George was sentenced to seven years in jail. And this is where our story takes its strangest turn and the worlds of fact and fiction collide. Three years after George was thrown in jail, he was finally granted parole. And even though he was out temporarily, his reputation had been permanently stained by the accusation. He was disbarred from practicing as a lawyer and obviously even had to move out of the village where he had grown up. With his life snatched away and his back to the wall, George was desperate for redemption. And in this desperation, he did something that would change the course of history. He wrote a letter. You see, during his three years in jail, George had spent a lot of time reading, desperately trying to find a mental escape from his situation. One series of books had particularly caught his eye. It was a series about this fascinating detective called Sherlock Holmes. The way he saw things no one else did, the way he would often save the innocent from terrible accusations and find the actual culprits was of special comfort to him within those jail walls. So when he was finally released on parole, he decided to write a letter to the author. See, in his mind, Sherlock Holmes and Arthur Conan Doyle are one and the same thing. So maybe Conan Doyle would be able to crack this case and prove his innocence the way Sherlock Holmes had done so many times in his books. I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but can you really blame the man? Look at his situation. Look at how desperate he was. There was absolutely nowhere else he could go. The funny thing is, when George's letter reached the author, he himself was going through a very dark phase in his life. His wife had just passed away from tuberculosis and the grief that he was feeling was intense, but it was also mixed in with a sense of guilt. You see, months before his wife had actually passed away, he had started up an affair with another woman. And now the guilt was eating away at him. So maybe too little and definitely too late, but when he read George's letter, in his mind, he saw this as an opportunity to redeem himself, to do some good in the world. In that moment, he decided that he would become this poor defenseless Indian man's champion. He would try to rebalance the scales of justice. He would become what he had only ever written about. And so, Arthur Conan Doyle picked up a pen and wrote a letter to George Adalji, asking him to meet him at a hotel in London.
On the day of their meeting, when Arthur Conan Doyle finally reached the hotel, he spotted a dark-skinned man sitting in the corner of the lobby. He was impeccably dressed and he was holding up a newspaper very close to his face and squinting his eyes in an effort to read it. As the only Indian in the room, Arthur knew that this had to be George. But in that moment, he had also figured out that George had to be innocent. If you remember, the night of 17th August, the night before George's arrest three years ago, when the horse had been killed, a huge storm had been blowing through the village of Great Worley. Arthur deduced that the man sitting before him, the man whose eyesight was so terrible that he had to read a newspaper by holding it inches from his face, could not possibly have crossed the dark, rainy fields at night and committed the heinous crime. Just like Sherlock, Arthur too had deduced an important fact about the subject before they had even spoken, simply by observing. Then Arthur walked over to George, introduced himself and the two men sat down and started talking. The first thing Arthur asked George was if his eyesight was indeed bad. George was surprised. He said, yeah, how did you know? I'm astigmatic. This highly critical fact had never been brought up at the trial. Arthur's eyes lit up and a phrase from one of his own books had jumped into his mind. The game was afoot. Sitting in that hotel lobby, George then began telling Arthur a story that shocked him. He told him how the police had actually arrested him at his office even before they had raided his home and found the evidence of the coat, the boots and the razor. He told him how the trial had just lasted for 50 minutes and then this is crazy. He told him that the animal killings had actually continued after he was thrown in jail and that a man had actually come up and confessed to killing some of the animals, but the police had not arrested him. He told Conan Doyle how the media had gone into a full-blown rampage persecuting his character in the days leading up to the trial. How newspapers were using his father's Parsi heritage to print wild stories of him being a dark oriental man from a strange religion that worshipped the sun god and sacrificed animals to him at night. No one seemed to care that George was born and brought up in England, that he was baptized as a Christian. It seemed that religion, nationality and in this case criminality was decided by how you looked. And then George told Arthur something that the world did not know yet. A final clue that put everything into perspective. Years before the animal killings had started, when George was just a 12-year-old boy, his family had begun receiving anonymous threats. Letters would show up at the vicar's house with obscene drawings of George's parents. Racial insults were graffitied on the walls of the house and sometimes feces were even thrown in through the window. The anonymous letters had repeatedly threatened to kill George. The Edalgis were understandably scared and they called in the police multiple times to help them, but they refused to do anything. In fact, on the other hand, when George was 17 years old, a key had gone missing from the school that he was attending. The police began searching and mysteriously and conveniently found it on the doorstep of the Edalgis' house. Everyone, including the police, blamed George. The chief constable at the time, a man called G.A. Anson, even threatened George that he would arrest him the minute he found some concrete proof. Oh, and by the way, this chief constable, G.A. Anson, was the same man who led the investigation into the animal killings 10 years later. The story was now clear in Arthur's mind, a story that spanned over a couple of decades since the arrival of an Indian man in the small English village of Great Worley. The animal killings had just been the finale, the stage had always been set for the arrest and persecution of George Adalji. In the days following their meeting, Arthur decided to devote the next phase of his life to proving George's innocence. This is when he got on that train to go visit the village the scene of the crimes. Arthur spent the next eight months in Great Worley researching the killings, but immediately upon arrival, when the news of his investigation spread, he faced backlash from the locals. It was almost as if they were afraid of what he would uncover. The locals became so hostile that Arthur could not live in the village while he continued his investigation. He had to look for accommodation outside the village. And if the locals were hostile, that was nothing compared to the chief constable, G.A. Anson. 
One meeting with him left Arthur convinced that this man was a racist and had no love for the Indians living in his village. In the months he spent investigating the case, he started collecting facts and with a surgeon-like precision that even Sherlock Holmes would have been proud of, Conan Doyle began dismantling and ripping apart the case against George Edalji. He discovered that George's parents had been present when the police had raided his home and recovered the coat, the boots and the razor. His parents later testified that the police had pointed to one thread on the coat and claimed that it was a hair from the dead horse. By the time the coat was examined by the forensic expert back at the police station, there were 26 hairs from the horse. Arthur also had George's eyesight tested professionally and his astigmatism was confirmed. Multiple doctors confirmed that there was no way that George was able to make the mile and a half journey from his house to where the horse was killed during that dark and stormy night. Then, the author found records at the police station that confirmed that a 19-year-old farmer called Harry Green had actually come up and confessed to killing one of the horses. Strangely, the police did not arrest him. And a few weeks later, when George was arrested and put on trial, Harry quietly bought a ticket to South Africa and left the country. Oh, and even after George was sent to prison, the animal killings continued. So after a while, some people made a petition to reopen the case. But Chief Constable Anson wrote to the Home Secretary requesting that the case remain closed because he was satisfied that George was guilty. The Home Secretary approved his request, but also failed to mention that Anson was actually his cousin. And the final nail in the coffin came when Arthur had the letter sent to the police, examined by handwriting experts. Not only was George's handwriting not a match, one of the letters was confirmed to have been written by the police themselves. They later admitted to doing this, apparently in an effort to trick George into confessing. By the end of the year, Arthur felt that he had enough evidence to prove George's innocence. But Apparently, at the time, in England, there was no law by which a convict could re-appeal his case once the verdict had been passed. So, in order to give George back his reputation and his freedom, Arthur knew that he would have to appeal to an even greater court, the court of public opinion. So, he used the one skill that he had, and Sherlock Holmes did not. He began to write. On 11th January 1907, Arthur Conan Doyle published the first of a series of articles about the case in the Daily Telegraph. The series went wildly viral. It had everything, terrible murders, accusations of racism, a crime writer who was now playing detective, and at the center of it all, a helpless, defenseless man. George Italji became the national conversation. The articles were even reprinted in newspapers around the world, making George and his case famous globally. Fellow authors such as J.M. Barry, creator of Peter Pan, Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula, and George Bernard Shaw all praised Arthur Conan Doyle's efforts and amplified his findings. Soon, the public outrage around the flawed investigation and the wrongful conviction of George Edalji grew so big that England couldn't just sweep it under the rug. The Prime Minister at the time himself had to step in. He asked the Home Office to appoint a committee to look into the case. And finally, in May 1907, the committee was forced to admit that the investigation had been flawed and George's conviction was overturned. George was officially cleared of the charges of killing the animals. But strangely enough, the Home Office Committee still stood by the accusation that George had been the one to write the letters to the police. But you see, this was a clever move by them, because this way, they legally got away without paying any compensation to George for the harassment because, well, technically, he was still guilty of part of the crime. In the years that followed this judgment, three very important things happened. The first, and probably the most long-term impact of this case, was that a major gap in England's laws was exposed. There was no way for people to appeal their sentences and get their cases properly re-examined. No legal way to do what Arthur had done for George. 
But due to the massive publicity that this case had received, England was inspired or forced, depending on how you look at it, to set up a court for criminal appeals, an institution and a mechanism that we take for granted today. Second, in 1934, almost 27 years after this judgment, a man called Enoch Albert Knowles was identified as the real writer of those letters to the police. He confessed to having been writing them for 25 years. However, he claimed that he didn't know who the real killer of the animals was. The case of the animal murders officially remains unsolved till today. Third, George did get back his license to practice law, but he decided to move to London for a fresh start. He had a sister living there called Maud, and he decided to move in with her. The siblings never went back to the village of their birth, Great Worley. His sister kept fighting for years to get compensation for the humiliation and expenses suffered by the family, but she was never successful. And on 17th June 1953, George Idalji passed away, penniless and forgotten. His gravestone reads, the strife is over, the battle is done. <laughs> Researching this story has been an emotional roller coaster for me. Because you see, I've often wondered which part of this story should I focus on? What's the theme? Do I focus on the racism of 19th century England or the selfless actions of an Englishman, Arthur Conan Doyle? Speaking of which, do I point out that his selfless actions were probably motivated by infidelity towards a dying wife? Do I highlight the injustices faced by immigrants, something relevant even today? Or do I highlight the fact that there are and always will be people who stand up to injustice regardless of race or color? But then I realized that if I had focused on any one of these things individually, I would have missed the point of the story completely. The point of the story is that all of these things happened. The point is the complexity of human nature and human stories. I can't leave you with that perfect ending with all the loose ends neatly tied up together and the victims living happily ever after because even though this story had all the mystery and drama of a Sherlock Holmes novel, it isn't one. This is real life. And real life is anything but elementary, my dear Watson. <laughs> <laughs>